application. He's not doing that. He's chasing around kids. He has a 10 and, a, and an 8-year-old boy. Um, and so sort of, I just imagine this great workshop with boys running around and metal getting banged. And this sounds like great fun. So please welcome Stuart Brown from 3D Engineers. Hello. Hello, as Rob said, I'm a Stuart from 3D Engineers in England, and we essentially create, recreate, and make new car designs and car parts for classic vehicles. Um, if I can get this clicker to work, that is an example of us spreading the magic around with what we do with a 92-year-old who's just got his car after 50 years of dreaming about it. So how did we actually get into doing this? Uh, I was an insurance bloke and absolutely hated the insurance world, but was kind of a wage slave and ended up uh, working 15 years there. And then a thing called the internet came along and we were completely destroyed and uh, managed to get out with just about a year's money to get me by. And in lots of ways, that's kind of similar to the situation we're in at the moment. And there's people doing scanning and CAD and all these different uh, elements separately. But there's a big change coming where, in my opinion, you're going to have to be an expert in lots of different areas to go and have a successful business ongoing. So, how, so when I decided to uh, uh, give up the insurance world, I had a year when I didn't have to do too much. And one of my friends rang up, and he was buying a DB4, Aston Martin. I didn't know, have a clue about CAD. I didn't have a clue about design. And uh, I was looking, but as he's talking to me about this car, I was looking at a parts manual, because I was selling some stuff on eBay to get by. I was looking at a parts manual for an Aston Martin. And I thought, this, this is easy. You could CAD this up. Well, of course, it wasn't easy. Um, and he went off and bought his car, and thought my idea of making one was, was mad. Um, and he's had many happy days on the back of a, a breakdown truck ever since, because they're not the most reliable cars in the world, even though they look great. So um, I continued with the, uh, to get the idea up and running, and thought, well, how am I going to do this? I know nothing about any of these subjects, but I'm, I'm certain that there's something that can be done here. So I decided to go and A, get a Halo project, and B, go and become the best as I could possibly be at different aspects of the, of the work. So the Halo project, that came across um, my path pretty easily, to be fair, in that there was a, a magazine article about how Bugatti um, had every single, well, not every single, but most of the plans for a Bugatti Type 35, which is a Grand Prix car from the um, mid-20s. Um, they'd actually collected all the parts, uh, all the plans up from France where they're going to be destroyed and had them in England, not too far from where I was. So I basically turned up at the Bugatti Trust and uh, I couldn't look any more different to the way they are. I turned up, I'd say, pretty scruffy, old hot hatchback car into this world of tweed and uh, executive vehicles. But they really helped me out and they said, OK, if you want to go and do this, we'll lend you the plans. Well, you can pay for the plans initially and then we'll lend them to you. So we started that process ongoing. The next stage of it was going and actually getting skilled in, uh, in a subject I knew absolutely zero about. So I did every course I could, every exam, uh, went back to university uh, to go do an engineering degree. So getting back to the, to the Bugatti, the problem that you've got when you're reverse engineering a car like this is what data are you going to going to use or discard um, on your way to getting the whole thing reverse engineered. Bugat Bugatti, who didn't have a mobile phone, had, had um, uh, like all manufacturers, uh, had a constant um, uh, process of making the cars better. So if you're thinking about creating a Bugatti Type 35 or a Jaguar E-Type or a, any, any car or, or, or plane or traction engine, uh, whatever it is it might be, you've got to really narrow your focus. With us, the Bugatti Type 35 went on from the mid-20s to um, uh, the 30s. And we just narrowed our focus to 18 cars, which was from 1924 to 25. And even then, the changes that they did were quite, quite significant. Um, but it was important that we got the car right, and it very became clear very soon after starting the project that absolutely no cars that exist at the moment, even though they're worth multi-million pounds, um, are, are correct. 
Um, so essentially, the first part of the, of the project was just a, a straightforward piles of plans, get them all into CAD, check them through, and then, then move on. Now, that took two years. Now, when the, my friend rang up about the DB4, that was six months into my year sabbatical. So it doesn't take a genius to work out. I'd run out of money. So um, what I had to do was do a horrible thing called get a job. And uh, the, the sad part about it was, that I live in the, a rural area, and the only job I could get was milking sheep, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking to the only CAD person that is a sheep milker as well. By the way, I cannot recommend that as a job. Minimum wage, four o'clock in the morning, twice a day, staring at sheep's rear end. It's not great. Um, and it's very smelly. So, but anyway, I stuck with it, and so uh, we carried on doing this car. We had some money coming in, yay. So we carried on doing the car. Um, once we'd had the, all the plans done, we could then bring them into an overall assembly. I did not, at the outset, I did not bring it into an assembly. I just did each individual plan as it was. Um, I made a slight miscalculation in that I thought, how many parts? I mean, how many parts do you think are in there? I thought, oh, 800? There's no lights, there's no, um, not a start motor, there's not a fuel pump. Oh, 800 parts, must cover it. 3,000. So, so we were a, a bit out of court on that one. Lucky enough, some of them were, um, you know, like pistons, there's eight of them, so you can just multiply them up quite easily. So once we'd done that, we put them into an assembly, and I was absolutely amazed because I thought modern computers would make a Tory Bugatti and his firm back in the early 20s look foolish. And the amount of errors we found on, on these hundreds of plans was less than 10. It was absolutely incredible. So the next stage uh, of the process began then, which was there was parts that we knew had to be on the car, but for which there were no plans so we then had to scour the country and, um, funny enough, all over the world, really, for these parts. And we were, we were very lucky in that a lot of people were incredibly generous actually sending these priceless parts through the post to someone they never knew who milked sheep to go and um, re reverse, reverse engineer them. Um, but we got there and we thought, brilliant, we've done it. All these parts are sorted out, you know. We can see it on there. And then it occurred to us, well, no. They're parts that are from a design. They need to be manufactured. And this is one of the key things where... Um, oh, by the way, with the, with the way the part we collected the parts, it was through scanning and normal measuring processes and, and all that kind of thing. Um, oh, wrong way. How do you do that? He's gone mad. Yeah, so that was the um, part of the car that we finished. Um, yeah, we collected them by uh, scanning and reverse engineering and, and, and traditional methods um, and made them into uh, CAD designs. But the problem that you've got is that although a drawing exists for an old part, it's a bit like the gentleman with the paintings, if you just took that to a CNC firm and got it made, it would look like it dropped off the planet CNC yesterday. It will it'll look incongruous. It's a bit like doing a fantastic picture of Abraham Lincoln, but somehow the clothes you put in lycra as opposed to, um, you know, a, a, you know the, the correct clothing. So um, we then had to go back and say, okay, this item was forged, this item was stamped, and, and add features and, and elements to it to give it a bit of variability. Uh, we're experimenting with bump maps at the moment to make it look a bit a bit different as well. Um, yeah, and there's the parts uh, parts in the car as well yeah there's about 3,000 so so essentially that was the the end of the Bugatti project um, as far as I want to go with the talk anyway it still continues to it to a certain extent trying to track down some various bits and bobs um, the next uh, thing that happened was was that I was happily working away on a Friday well kind of working away on a Friday afternoon finished milking um, I was doing a bit of Bugatti frippery on the computer and then my wife came in incredibly angry, which was unusual for her. Normally she's very, very calm. And uh, she was like, you know, what are you doing here? It's been five years. You know, actually for four or five years. And uh, we're still earning virtually no money and you're mucking around with this free Bugatti project and you smell like a farmyard animal. So can you not go and do something? So with a, with a bit of reluctance, I picked up a car magazine, which I regret now actually. 
I picked up a car magazine, emailed every person in the magazine, and uh, said to them, you know, this is what I do. Almost unbelievably, within 10 minutes, I got a call back saying, I need a car designing, can you help me out? Or, or a nip and a tuck, as he put it. And what it was, was he had this car, it's called a Mitchell Special, he designed it himself, and he went racing in it. But because he created it all himself, it was full of filler, or I think you call it Bondo in this country, and um, it weighed, uh, weighed a lot, and it wasn't the best looking car in the world. And anyway, I went to see him, and it became apparent after uh, uh, you know, a few minutes that we, what it didn't need was a nip and tuck, what it actually needed was a complete new body. Um, so uh, he th essentially threw me 50 pictures of cars he liked, 50 pictures of cars he hated, I said, look, get on with it. I want you to get me something unique that's in the spirit of that kind of car, but it's, it's not like any of them. Oh, blimey, one second. It's not like any of them. So that is what we came up with. Um, that car, from concept to actually being at its first race at Silverstone, which is where it is there, it took seven months, uh, which for an aluminium, well, for any car, but let alone an aluminium car, is, is almost unheard of. Um, literally racing in seven months' time. So how did we go about doing that? Essentially, uh, he already had a chassis that he'd created. I saw the picture of this is absolutely rubbish, but that's the kind of working environment we had. And this goes to, again, the core of what I'm trying to uh, hopefully explain towards the end of the, the speed, uh, the talk, in that he was so focused on me scanning that chassis, it was unbelievable. He wanted to see the scanner, he wanted to see all the blah, blah, blah. And I looked at it and thought, this isn't a scanning job. This is, a, this is a, a literally getting your Mark I tape measure out, your calipers, verniers, and a few basic measuring tools. We got a little decorator's table in the workshop, put the laptop on it, and within two days, we'd created the, the chassis um, in CAD. It's a pretty simple job. But the fact is, is that it saved him a fortune because we saved the scanning, which is more expensive than CAD, we saved the post-processing, and it got him exactly the result he needed, which, which was the foundations for, the, uh, for how we were going to drape the body over the car. So we've got the chassis. We know where all the hard points are. We did a basic little block for the engine, all sorted. So the next thing to do was create the body design, which is what we've done here, essentially draping it over. And what you see underneath the body is what's called a body buck, um, it's a misconception that people think you actually hammer on the buck to get the shape, but it's literally just used as a, as a guide. Um, and it saves perhaps 20 or 30% on the time on building a car than if you freeform it. And crucially for him, it saves a whole lot of Bondo being put into the, put into the vehicle. So um, that, was, that was that. And there's a... I will get used to this one. Well. So, and that was, again, the body draped over the, over the, the thing. So the essential brilliant way of using this um, sort of traditional measuring and scanning technique and um, when it comes to the cars is that you can cut down on the well on, you can cut down on the on the on the people wasting time making sharp up, making stuff up on the workshop floor. If you don't know cars, well if you do know cars, perhaps it's a better way of putting it you will know that just a vast amount of time is wasted where people make stuff, it doesn't work. Then they do it again and it doesn't work. And, and it can go on for absolutely, absolutely years. The other thing I was gonna say was about the design of the car, was that um, where I think we, we score is that we, we're kind of like old car people. There's new car shapes and old car shapes. And we seem to be able to create old car shapes. Um, so, that is that, and we did. And, oh yeah, that was it as well. Essentially, before we we went to production on the car, there was a little bit of the car which we just couldn't suss out. It just didn't work, and it was just below the cowl on the top. You can't really see it but on the top of the wing. It just didn't work for us. So we got a, a model made, and again, this is where I think knowing about old techniques really helps because basically, long before three D printing and um, all the modern uh, techniques we've got now to do stuff, which I use and I love, um, they didn't have it, obviously. And in the 50s and before, if you wanted to make up a car shape, you basically carved it out of balsa wood. And they had a brilliant technique, which works today with, uh, you can have this one for free, with small 3D models. 
And that is, if you go and place a model in a box and then just put a little pinhole through the box, look through it, you have the effect of scaling up the whole body. So you can play it being Gregario for 50p. It's absolutely brilliant. So that was, we, we used that and that saved, we thought, oh yeah, that's, that's it, that's exactly where it is. We couldn't really see it on the computer. Um, and that works for us. If anyone's here that's designing cars on computer, my top tip would be that whatever amount of curve you put into a car on a computer, add about 20% more. It will always be flatter than you think it will be. So that is the gentleman driving around his car in Dorset, and uh, he's exceptionally uh, happy with it. He's still got it, to, got it to this day. So, oh, blimey. There should be some more slides, but they appear to have disappeared somewhere. Um, so essentially, that, that, was ha that is how we do the car thing. What I would like to say um, towards the end of this is, is that I, th I really feel that it's important that everyone that puts themselves forward as a scanning person or a CAD person or whatever, you're making yourself vulnerable unless you use the method that we use, which is a, uh, we call it a mashup method, which basically means that one person in our team goes and does the whole thing and they'll, be, they'll do the CAD, they'll do the scanning, they'll do the scan post-processing, and the effect for our clients is, is that that means that they don't, you don't have this situation where the CAD's done, then it's gone off to someone else, there's a delay, then it comes back, then that's what, you know, we, we flick between all these programs, you know, 10, 15 times an hour, I don't know, a lot. So that is by far the best method to approach this kind of job. Also, when you think about it, the client doesn't actually care how something happens, he just wants a result. So if you go and, um, uh, like with that chassis, if you are a scanning firm and you say, okay, we'll scan the chassis for you, you're not actually giving him the best advice because you know in your heart of hearts it's better to be done a different route. That's all you can provide. Um, so essentially, that, I believe, is, 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 is it. Yeah, that's what I've got to say. So, yeah. I, 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 I,